Gentlemen, it is never good news when the three of you are here. But let's try to make some sort of sense of what happened and where we go from here. Senator, this latest shooting comes almost exactly a year since Uvalde. What are people in Texas saying tonight? Well, Stephanie, I think they're saying enough is enough. I mean, we've had this over and over just 10 days prior to this. We saw what happened in San Jacinto County when five other people were killed in a mass shooting. Um, this senseless killing needs to stop, but unfortunately, Republicans in power won't do anything about it. You ask how, how we're feeling and how people are doing. Uh, people across the state are, are, are crying and grieving. We lost those two little girls that uh, they're never coming home. The Cho family, they're, this poor child is gonna be a, an orphan. This whole family gone. Uh, everybody that lost their life, it just, none of this makes any sense. But what I'm tired of is I'm tired of, you know, Republicans saying that they're thinking about these folks and praying about these folks. And we saw some of that today. And I don't doubt that the feelings of, of the people in the Texas Capitol today that talked about this issue and cried about this issue, I don't doubt that they don't feel bad for them. But if you feel bad for them, do something about this so it doesn't happen to anybody else. That's the overriding sentiment I think I see. They need our prayers and a lot more. Matthew, same question to you. The last time you were on this show was the, Unite, was the night of the Uvalde massacre. What are you hearing mm -hmm. one year later from Texans? I mean, I think Texans are tired, you know, the, the, the terrible stories we heard out of Uvalde, the, you know, hearing children uh, shot, dying in the classrooms, it's, it's hard to live with. And then to hear now about, you know, a six-year-old who's lost both their parents, their parents and uh, a younger sibling, it's just, it's, it's hard to live with. And, and I think people across the state are just you know, not numb because they still feel the pain of this, but uh, just kind of disbelief that this continues to happen and that we're allowing this to continue to happen in this state and, and, and really across the country. It's, you know, I've, I've been involved in coverage of way too many of these these shootings in, in, in the past few years. And it's 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 just hard to grapple with that. It just keeps happening and we keep having to go through this routine again. Why are Texans allowing it, Senator? Because at the end of the day, lawmakers do, in theory, what their constituents want. So what are people saying they want? I mean, the governor's response, again, was a focus on mental health. And while mental health is an issue that plagues this country, it wasn't mental health that massacred those people. Well, you're right, uh, Stephanie. In theory, you know, you are all of our constituents, not in theory, but generally speaking right now, the polling numbers are high on this issue. Seventy six percent of all voters want to see a change here and they want to see common sense gun solutions, raising the age limit, extreme risk protective orders, closing the gun show loophole. The fact is, these Republicans aren't leaders are, are not leading. You've got Greg Abbott going around telling everybody, well, this is evil and, and, and it's a mental health crisis. Uh, you know, it's domestic terrorism, every excuse under the sun. Certainly we have uh, all of those things are true. But why in the world would you have a situation in a state where Republicans have put a system in place, a crazy system that allows everybody and anybody that wants to have a gun to have a gun, including mentally ill people, including, uh, you know, white supremacists. There is not one thing that keeps these kinds of people people that shouldn't have a gun from having a gun in Texas. Ben, I thought of you this weekend because I would not want to trade places with you. I know you were tracking the social postings of the shooter. It's been reported. Uh, he was posting extremist beliefs. What can you tell us? Yeah, um, really quickly, Steph, if there is some sort of mental health thing that we can do about this, domestic terror thing that we can look into, it probably would have, would have been about this guy. You know, he posted a YouTube video that was on YouTube proper. You just go visit it today of him taking off a scream mask and saying, um, it's, this is not who you thought it was, was it? Because he was already so deeply ingrained in white supremacist culture online that the fact that he was Latino was supposed to be a big reveal. He was very deeply into white supremacist spaces. He had uh, an SS tattoo on his arm and a swastika on his chest. Um, this guy was not stopped from purchasing a gun. This guy wasn't stopped from doing anything. Um, in fact, he found a bigger community online. And I think the most disturbing part tonight is that when you bring this up on the Internet, they say, you know what? It's all too perfect, Steph. It's all too perfect. It couldn't have actually happened this way. 
you know, here's a guy with a Hispanic name who's a white supremacist. What's that all about? See Elon Musk doing this right now, you know, playing around with people doing false flag theories on the Internet. And I've been covering this stuff. I started on this beat eight years ago, covering a false flag theory about my friend uh, whose uh, girlfriend was shot and killed on live TV in Roanoke, Virginia. And now that guy's playing around with it. The richest guy in the world is playing around with it. Explain to me. I don't understand what you're saying. It's the idea. The false flag theory is the idea that this didn't actually happen or that this guy was set up by the feds and he wasn't a white supremacist. He couldn't have been. That's the prevailing notion on the right. Not we need to fix mental health. Not we need to fix domestic terrorism. Definitely not anything having to do with guns. So it's it that we must abscond from the responsibility of the online fever swamps that we've helped create. So this shooting happens, and tell me exactly what you do and how hard it was for you to find this shooter, his posts, and the community that he's in. Because in my mind, I think this is in the dark corners of the Internet that you need all sorts of things to unlock. Okay, so to find the guy, um, there's something tied to his email address that tied him to this Russian social media site that kind of looks like MySpace called OK. VK is their Facebook, OK is their MySpace. On there, there's pictures of nonstop Nazi paraphernalia, months of it. Most of it posted on April 21st, which was a few weeks ago. Him, his diaries posting about all sorts of plans for this precise event. Uh, How do you feel reading that? Really bad. But you know what makes me feel worse is I go on Twitter, I go, go on civilian internet, you know, the, the regular internet, and I see pictures of children, I'm not blurred out, just children bleeding out on the sidewalk. <laughs> and that, um, that's something that used to not really be very visible. Why? I, that was my next question to you, right? I have a 16-year-old that on Saturday was sending this to me. My kids, I never had access to these kind of images after something like this would happen. What has changed? Yeah, so your kid who's probably on Twitter looking up, like, basketball stuff, right? Correct. Regular, you know, looking up basketball highlights. Exactly. And then he sees the trending topic, Allen, Texas. He's like, I wonder what that's about. He clicks on it, and he sees a picture of, you know, a six-year-old bleeding out or a three-year-old bleeding out. One of these family members. One of these family members. Not blurred out, just happening. You want to know why it's everywhere? It's because the gore... Uh, accounts on Twitter right now are getting boosted because they have the most engagements. They, they're the people who are getting the most people responding and saying, oh my God, it's terrible. That gets boosted to the top of this thing called the For You page, which makes it so everyone sees it. In previous, um, I know people like to bag on Facebook, and I understand that. But um, they used to do this thing called hashing for ISIS videos. They created it for ISIS videos where there were stuff, they would take videos, turn them into code. <laughs> for ISIS videos, for beheading videos. And that code would make it so if anyone posted anything like that, it would get instantly flagged by Facebook and taken down by a robot. For some reason, that's not on there on Twitter right now. I'm assuming it's because it's sat by a couple people. Has Twitter responded? No, if you, if you reach out to Twitter, you get a poop emoji in response. So that's the sort of care that's going into this sort of I thing. need you to tell our audience this again. Yes. So right now, yeah. if you go on to Twitter, and you see one of these videos of these children who have been massacred and they're bleeding out in the street and you contact Twitter and you say, hey, this video is up there. What happens? Yeah, you get a poop emoji from the press, from the press team at Twitter. And like that, that's a nice prank for when stuff like this isn't going on, right? If you're, if you're asking about you know, earnings or something or how many subscribers the Twitter blue has. But on days like that, it doesn't really work that way. And I'm just saying that this is the, this guy... <laughs> is trying to make it easier for this stuff to happen because it desensitizes you to the horrors, horrors of the world, desensitizes your kids to the horrors of the world. We're they are, not... But they, they we're just horrifying them on a day-to-day -day basis. We will not be desensitized. Uh, Matthew, what can you tell us about how the shooter got these weapons? Um, they're, he's 33 years old. Did he get them legally? Who is this person? How did it happen? So, yes, yeah, so we, we haven't heard from official sources where the gun was purchased yet. We know that he had an AR-15. Um, but, you know, frankly, the, the state police have not released very much information. We haven't had a press conference in two days. We haven't really had any kind of an opportunity to ask um, officials questions, even from the day that it happened. We're hearing that there might be an update tomorrow. But, you know, the, the idea is it's not hard to access an AR-15 in the state of Texas. You can order one online and go pick one up at a gun store. You know, as long as you're over the age of 18, as we learned from the shooting in Uvalde, you can get one without really much of an intervention. 
Senator, Uvalde parents pushed for this gun bill that made it through committee today, raising the age from 18 to 21. Um, that's somewhat of a positive, but what's the likelihood it's going to be made into law? Well, Stephanie, I mean, it, the, the likelihood is slim, and the families understand that, and they know that they're going to keep working because their children didn't die in vain, and they're going to keep working and pushing back against the system that is made Texas more dangerous. And that's what Republicans have done. They've te made Texas more dangerous. I want to add this. Uh, ben commented on this earlier. The fact is, after the Walmart shooting in 2019, we had a right-wing extremist guy. The Republicans created a domestic terrorism task force headed by the governor, lieutenant governor, a bunch of other people, including Steve McCroft with DPS. That task force and a special unit within DPS was supposed to track guys like this and their messaging on social media. They failed yet again. Uvalde's failure was a 77-minute horrific kind of failure. This one is no different. Here you have a special task force created to follow this kind of madness, and they didn't get it done. And little children died and families died because the government in Texas failed them. So you ask about these folks and this, this bill, they're going to keep fighting no matter what happens this session. Uh, afterwards today, I had lunch with the families. They said, look, you know, we're going to keep doing. We're going to keep doing what we're doing because it's right, because it's just, because we never want this to happen to anyone else ever. They are fighting for the safety of our kids, and we're grateful for it. Matthew Watkins, State Senator Roland Gutierrez, my friend Ben Collins, thank you all so much. We're in a situation now where those 1,500 people at the border, they're not there to enforce the law. They're there to free up the border agents that need to be on the border, and we're having another 1,000 people coming in, or asylum judges to make judgments, to move things along. I've asked this Congress for help in terms of what they need at the border. They need more agents. They need more people to clear people. They need more action to, for example, we need these farm workers. They're badly needed. There has to be a legal pathway to citizenship. I asked President Biden about the border in our interview on Friday. He's taken a lot of heat from both sides as a pandemic era restriction known as Title 42 is set to expire on Thursday. Meanwhile, the White House says Biden would veto a Republican led immigration bill if it reaches his desk. The bill would add 22,000 Border Patrol agents and force the administration to resume work on Donald Trump's border wall. Joining me now to discuss Victoria DeFrancesco Soto, the dean of the Clinton School of Public Service at the University of Arkansas and an MSNBC political analyst and former Republican congressman and CIA officer Will Hurd, who is from the state of Texas. Congressman, we've been hearing a lot about this migrant surge. We know that the president gets pressure from the left about the humanity issue around this and from the right saying he is not putting American interests first and from employers, big and small, who are saying we need to fix immigration because we've got a labor shortage. Yet all of these three separate groups who are complaining, it's, 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 not, mean, it's not making anything get done in Congress. Is there any chance something will happen? Look, I, I think the the possibility for something in Congress getting done is is very low. I, I think the the likelihood, if anything, were to pass, would probably start in the Senate. Uh, but there's a few things that could happen that doesn't need uh, congressional approval. Uh, we can stop treating everybody who comes to the United States of America illegally as an asylum seeker. Asylum is very specific thing. You have to be part of a protected class. You got to demonstrate that your government is is prosecute persecuting you because you're part. Of that protected class. Now, I want to make sure when people are in our custody, we treat them humanely, uh, but, but allowing and fueling human traffickers to bring 6.5 million people into this country illegally is, is not humane. Um, so that's something that can be done. That is, the, you, you don't need Title 42 to do that. Um, people have, have been uh, deporting folks for uh, a long time, and, and that's something that can be done now. We can make sure our, our, our diplomats and our State Department is engaged in this effort to address 
some of the root causes in, in, in these countries, particularly the Northern Triangle, which historically has been, uh, has what's caused uh, illegal, has fueled illegal immigration uh, to the United States. Those are just some of the things that can be done uh, right now. Oh, and by the way, let's make dismantling human smugglers a national intelligence priority and use those resources uh, to stop the $25 million that was, that was earned um, by human smugglers in Mexico just last year alone. Victoria? So we definitely need to address the root causes, right, in terms of the issues of the sending countries and what the American government can do to try to ameliorate that, whether on the political front or the economic front. But in addition to that, I want to zero in on the infrastructure of the State Department, on the infrastructure of Homeland Security, in terms of how do we process these people. The reason we have surges at the border is because folks are desperate to get in and there isn't the infrastructure to process their asylum claims. What President Biden has proposed is to establish a network of regional processing centers across Latin America to stem that flow and to the congressman's point, really address the issue of human smugglers. Because if we have an efficient and effective regional processing system across Latin America, people who need to leave their country, whether for humanitarian reasons or to seek farm work here in the United States, cut out that middleman, which is incredibly dangerous. So I think what I'm really looking at here is that infrastructure that the administration can put into place. I agree with the congressman. Any chance of immigration reform in Congress is nil. But I think the administration does have a lot of power in terms of implementation to address what happens with immigration post Title 42. Congressman, another issue, the country, but really Texas is grappling with tonight is guns. It was the scene of multiple mass shootings over the last few weeks. What are people throughout Texas saying? Well, well, people throughout Texas are, are, are frustrated. They're sad. The fact that um, there's moms and dads that have to be in the Capitol trying to advocate to make sure uh, things don't happen to other people's kids. Um, you know, they, they want to see something done. They didn't elect people to to just they, they, they elected people to actually solve problems and and simple things. Right. Like uh, increasing the age to buy a long gun to to 21. Um, this is something that a majority of Americans believe in a majority. Of, 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 of law-abiding gun owners actually believe they want to see some of these things change. Uh, universal background checks, that seems uh, like, a, like a no-brainer. I think your earlier panel, when they discussed about how uh, social media is being used to radicalize people and how some of these tools are being allowed to propagate, um, people want to see some of those things change. And, and, and ultimately, if we want to see that change and, and, and we know that uh, the public uh, cares about these issues, we need to get more people voting in primaries um, because oftentimes you have better choices there and folks need to need to stand up and say enough is enough. Could things be changing, though, in Texas? Victoria, today at the Texas state capitol, two Republicans voted to advance a gun safety bill. It's unlikely to become law. But is that something you ever thought you would see in the state of Texas? This is heartening, Stephanie. Um, for decades, Texas has been going in the direction of loosening gun laws. So in the last couple of years, they allowed for open carry on college campuses. They allowed for open carry. And the trend was going in the opposite direction. And this is small. It got out of committee, and it's probably going to die in the body. But the fact that it got out of committee, that two Republicans cross party lines, is a very big deal because this change is going to be incremental. I wish I could say that one more shooting and the tide is going to change. It's not. But this is, for me, a light. This is the frustration of folks in Texas that they are putting pressure on their elected officials. And to the point earlier, also, this has to be reflected in the voting booth. So this is an important first step, regardless of what happens. It got out of committee. One ray of light, it drowns out the dark. It's got to start somewhere. Victoria DeFrancesca Soto, Will Hurd, thank you both for being here.